Welcome once again to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. Our first major conversation this morning is uh, taking a look at the current uh, issues Nigeria uh, you know, is dealing with with regards to uh, the arrest of Namdi Kanu, the leader of the IPOB, and Sunday Boho, the Yoruba Secessionist uh, leader. We, of course, are going to be speaking this morning with uh, Nick Agule, who's joining us from Abuja. Uh, good morning, Mr. Agule. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Fantastic. Thanks for joining us. The conversation really is about um, what the role Nigeria, um, it, what Nigeria is trying to achieve in uh, uh, arresting these persons and how it might be difficult or maybe really easy for Nigeria. Uh, the country has always been seen as the big brother in the African continent. But at the same time, there's other angles that I believe need to be looked at here. So let's first of all get your views on um, Sunday Igboho's arrest and the reports this morning of the Republic of Bene refusing to you know, go with Nigeria's uh, demand of repatriating him to the country. Uh, my view on the arrest of uh, Sunday Igboho in the Republic of Bene is that the Nigerian government must have had a role in this by informing the authorities in Benin Republic, declaring uh, Sunday Boho as a fugitive and someone who is on the run from the law and possibly involved the Interpol as well. And as Sunday Boho was at the airport trying to board a flight, uh, as it is said, to a Western country, he was apprehended. And I follow him on Twitter. So this morning, he has tweeted that he's going to be in court in Cotonou and that his followers who are close by can join him. So that indicates that uh, legal proceedings, possibly for extradition, have commenced or are about to commence in the Republic of Benin. And that will be at the behest of Nigeria that must have requested for his extradition to, to, to Nigeria. And this is a, is a bit different from the case of... Uh, Namdi Kanu. Uh, Nika Gule, can you hear Namdi us? Kanu, who was moved to Nigeria. Uh, Sunday Boho's tweet this morning indicates that in Benin Republic, the legal process is, is actually being followed. Because he said he's going to be in court. Okay, so Mr. Agule. So that's my view on okay. Sunday Bohos. So Mr. Agule, we discussed the issue of uh, the, Bene, the role of the Bene Republic in this matter with Nick, um, with um, Sunday Adeyemo, also known as Sunday Bohu, and the federal government. And one of the things I raised was the extradition treaty of 1984 between Togo, Nigeria, Ghana, and Benin Republic. And we talked about how in this, you know, um, extradition treaty, it went on to guarantee, um, you know, secession, the rights of secessionist agitators, and that, you know, these people will have this freedom and that there will be no extradition plan regarding that, you know. So we see now that Benin Republic seem to be saying that the rule of law will take precedence. How do you think, you know, Nigeria is going to react to this? Because right now, the federal government is not saying anything. Well, Nigeria has no choice than to follow the rule of law. It is actually very, very good. I mean, I, 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 I give kudos to the leadership, the political leadership in Benin Republic for insisting on the rule of law. If we don't run things with the law, Things are not going to work well. Those countries where we think things are working, like in the developed world or in the advanced world or in the Western world, things are working there because everybody has been brought under the law. It doesn't matter whether you are the president or you are the prime minister or you are the lowest man in the, in the society. In fact, the bigger you are, the better the law goes after you. You know, there are certain things that maybe the man uh, on the street can do that can get away with but a big man cannot get away with it because uh, the whole media and, and everybody will be out to ensure that the rule of law prevails so if we want to build a country that is going to develop and will be enjoyed 
by every citizen, we have no choice than to follow the law. So, so. the Republic are very, very correct to insist on the rule of law, and Nigeria, we should have no reaction to it other than to follow the rule of law. So that at the end of the day, we know whether Sunday Igboho can be legally extradicted back to Nigeria or not. The law must take its course, and Nigeria must accept that. Okay, so I want us to look at this from the standpoint of Nigeria being that giant of Africa, that country that, you know, when it sneezes, the rest of Africa catches cold, and how Nigeria and the government seem to want to, you know, exert its influence to say that Benin Republic must release Sunday Buhu, but now they, they, they have, you know, resisted that. So would you say that Nigeria might regard this as a slap on its face? Well, uh, if Nigeria regards a legal proceeding, a country, a sovereignty, insisting on the rule of law and that a, a legal proceedings must be followed and takes that to be a slap on their face, then Nigeria is the one slapping itself on the face in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Committee of Nations. We will be making a laughing stop, will become a joke in the eyes of the international community as a country that is lawless, that, that is a country that does not want to follow the law. So as Nigeria has no choice than to follow the law as being insisted upon by the Republic of Benin. This is not a case of slapping in the face. We are not in a dictatorship. We are in a democracy. And in a democracy, people's human rights must be, uh, must be, uh, must be, must be, must be obeyed must be respected. And if a republic like Benin insists that the rule of law must take its place, we have no choice than to allow the rule of law to take its place. It All has right. nothing to do with slapping us in the face. There initially was some controversy over whether Nigeria did follow this same rule of law with regards uh, repatriating or bringing Namdikanu back to Nigeria from Kenya, where he was reportedly arrested. Um, there was, you know, conversations back then, a few weeks ago, whether the, you know, we broke some international laws and the likes. Um, but with regards to Sunday Boho's case, um, the Nigerian government has uh, so far been silent. There's still been no word from the Nigerian government as to what exactly has happened um, or, you know, what role they played. So is it important that we hear from the Nigerian government to know exactly why Sunday Boho was arrested in Benin Republic? if it was done in collaboration with the Nigerian government in the first place, or they're just taking advantage of the fact that he was arrested for breaking a different law entirely in Benin. It's very important. Communication is a key ingredient in governance, especially political governance. The, and Nigeria's government has no choice than to communicate with the people. Nigeria must communicate with the people. We have countries where the president are coming out to talk to the people. They are coming out to inform the people and give people updates about the goings on in governance. And we're not having that in Nigeria. So we expect a statement either from the presidency, as in Nigeria we don't expect the president to address matters like this, but the presidency must of necessity right, address Nigerians on the situation. Is it Nigeria that asks for the arrest of Sunday Boho? Is it Nigeria that is seeking for the extradition of Sunday Boho? Or Nigeria does not have a hand in this? This is very, very key that we must hear from the highest authorities in the government of Nigeria as to what is going on as regards Sunday Boho. This right. is a key ingredient of governance especially in a democracy like ours all right uh, once again good morning to mark adebayo thank you for joining us good morning Mr. Th adebayo. thank you all right yeah, good morning all right um so good i'm going to bring you in with regards understanding exactly what is going on with the silence from the nigerian government um there is possibilities that you know the same thing that played out in kenya where the government was criticized for you know, maybe also not going through the, you know, the proper uh, channels to, you know, bring uh, Namdi Kanu back to Nigeria. 
There's people who have said that maybe it was it's uh, the same thing that they are trying to do here with Sunday Igboho, but it you know, seems to be failing. So is, is it important that we understand why he was arrested? And also, what would you say is the due process that must be followed in a case like this before Sunday Igboho would be brought back to Nigeria? Thank you so much. The due process, the international best practices will be that if it could be established that Sunday Igboho uh, was a, a wanted fugitive or a fugitive from the law, the normal process is to take him to court in that country while an extradition uh, case will be leveled against him and he will argue his case in court. So it depends on the legal processes of that country that would, you know, enable uh, him to be to be repatriated to Nigeria. But you cannot just grab him like you did with Kanu and bring him to Nigeria to face the law. It is, it's, as a matter of fact, it's an international crime. Now, what is happening now is that Nigeria is increasingly behaving like a rogue country, like a rogue state, you know, behaving like a rogue state. And it would, it would cause it a lot of problems in the, in the community of nations, the way we are behaving. Let us even go back to the basics, to the fundamentals. What are the crimes of a Sunday Igboho? A Sunday Igboho that rose up to say that enough of killing my people, enough of raping my people, enough of destroying the properties and farms of my people. How does that amount to crime? It does not, in any way, it does not amount to crime. So, you see, look, you push a people to self-help when you have an irresponsible government that refuses to protect the people, that refuses to defend the people, a government that actively supports killer others, that actively, actively, a presidency that actively supports killer others, that you cannot you know, expect the people to sit back and do nothing to defend themselves. Self-defense cannot be a crime. I have not seen anywhere whatsoever that Sunday Ibuho, Sunday Adeyemo has committed any crimes for him to be hunted internationally. Like I did say at the beginning, Nigeria is becoming a rogue state. And I want to seriously advise this federal government, this is not 1984. This is not 1985. And aside from the fact that we are not in the military junta, General Muhammadu Buhari must understand that this is a democracy. We are okay. supposed to behave like a civilized nation, like a civilized country that we are supposed to be. Okay, Mr. What, Debayo. What do you mean by giant of Africa? Look, but the Republic is now trying to teach us how to behave, how not to misbehave internationally. And that is why they are insisting on following due process. Are you aware that even the extradition, whatever treaty that was between Nigeria and Syria, Leon, I think uh, Cote d'Ivoire, so four countries, it does not cover people who are fighting for their rights. It does not cover people who are fighting for self-determination, like in the case of Sonia Adeyemo. He is fighting for self-determination. That treaty, extradition treaty says that you cannot extradite somebody who is fighting for his rights, who is fighting for self-determination. So I do not see how Nigeria is going to win the case in court, legally yeah. speaking. Okay. But Adibai, we see that they are applying diplomatic pressure yeah. on the Republic. Mr. Adibai, yeah. I just want, I want us to quickly, if, if necessary, fix uh, one, of you, one of the statements you made. You said the government is actively supporting killer headers. Um, yes. Those are pretty strong uh, statements. I don't know if you would yes. like, if you stand by them or you would like to retract uh, I those, those statements. I stand by the fact that the federal government under General Muhammad Buhari is a major enabler and protector of killer others. Why do I, how do I mean? When, uh, when uh, the southern governors decided that they wanted to set up Amotek Southwest, the federal government resisted them because they wanted to defend their people. When Governor Kerry Donu declared that all his bushes, the bushes in the state, must be rid of killer others, the federal government took gun by share rose up against him. The Attorney General of the Presidential rose against him. When they said they are, they, they are banning uh, open blessing in the South, the whole of the 17th state of the South, the Northern governors, the presidency, the Attorney General of the Federation, 
including the ATL, arose against these governors, sitting governors. So that's why I say they speak for them, they protect them, they defend them. I mean, those are the evidences. Those are the facts. And when uh, Mr. Sarakuni was killed in Odo State, it was discovered that one of the major killers who enabled that killing was the PR of Yetiala in Odo State. But each time the state governments of the South, the state governors of the South, come up with an initiative to protect the people from killer others. If the first people, the first agency that will rise up in defense of the killer others, in the presidency. Okay, Mr. Mark Adebayo. Mr. Adebayo, yes. thank you very much. Um, can you hold on? Let's uh, bring in Mr. Nick Agule to share his views regarding this. Um, Mr. Agule, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So, on the back of what Mr. Adebayo said, um, I've been able to pull out a report by um, a, uh, by Vanga newspaper that says that um, the presidency is arresting secessionists and romancing bandits. How do you react to that? The, we are in a democracy. So in a democracy, don't have to carry on with the governance process as if we are in a democracy. Uh, Mr. Agule. A democracy okay. is a government by and the people have to decide on how now if the people of Nigeria want to come to a table and discuss the future of Nigeria, that should be allowed to happen. Unfortunately, those who crafted the constitution of Nigeria did not constitution of Nigeria. And that is, you cannot force people into a marriage. There has to be a provision for a referendum. And look, a provision for a referendum is not only for secession. A provision for a referendum could even be to, like, we, we went and joined AFTA, which is the uh, African Free Trade uh, continental free trade uh, agreement. Ideally, we needed a referendum before we joined that. It's the same way in the EU. Any nation in the EU that joined the EU had a referendum for their people to say they want to join the EU or not. And as in the case of the United Kingdom, after they joined the EU, they had a referendum exit from the EU, which is called Brexit. Brexit was a referendum by the people. So the Nigerian constitution must make provision for referendums. And it behoves on Nigerians, all Nigerians, to hold their representatives in the National Assembly accountable to amend the constitution of Nigeria and provide for a referendum. Because without a referendum, the voices of the people cannot be heard in this democracy. And a democracy without the voices of the people is not democracy at all. Mm. Okay, so Mr. Agule, also, um, what do you say to how this situation has now turned out? Where it seems that Nigerians are speaking in one voice. You know, when you check social media, you hear statements from clerics, from politicians, you know, all saying that Sunday Ubuhu is a freedom fighter and how it seems that the federal government, you know, the fact that the federal government is going after him have seemed to put him on this pedestal and the Nigerians now support him and see him as a hero. There are two things. I support wholeheartedly that the people, if they want to secede, be given a voice to say so, but I don't believe that that should be pursued through extrajudicial or extralegal means. It has to be followed by the rule of law. So I would say that the process that needs to be followed by the Sunday Bohos and Ebnam Dikanus is not to take any arms 
and begin to fight for substitution because that is not the rule of law. What they need to do, and Nandi Kano Sunday Bo, or whoever has this idea of self determination, is to follow the due course of the law. And the due course of the law is first and foremost to amend the constitution of Nigeria. So that when we amend the constitution of Nigeria to make provision for a referendum, then a referendum is called. And when the referendum is called, whatever is the decision of the people via that referendum must be obeyed. All right, well, Take, that, for that, instance, that, that, the agitation. Yeah, that, 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 would, that would really be... of Nigeria. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Mr. Uh, yeah, I think you can go on, but we need to move to our debate in a bit. But I was just going to say that would be um, in a situation where there is a, you know, a huge level of trust for the National Assembly members that you're referring to. Uh, if you want them to reach out to their representatives in the National Assembly, uh, I think you, you may also consider the fact that a lot of these persons may not have, you know, a lot of trust in these persons who supposedly represent them. Now... I agree with you that, in the fact, to me, I don't even think we have a National Assembly now. The people who are in Abuja, I don't think they are representing our interests. And we can see how they have carried on with the Electoral B and even the PRB, you know. We, so, but the Constitution there hands the powers to us. We sent them to Abuja. And if they are not in Abuja for our good. And they are pursuing some other agenda that is against what we serve our purpose. The same constitution of Nigeria provides us the powers to recall them, bring them home, and then elect those who will go to Abuja and do our bidding. The problem is that Nigerians are so docile. We don't mm -hmm. even want to use the powers that have been granted us by the mm -hmm. Constitution. Just mm -hmm. imagine <laughs> that we had this uh, electoral bill and some senators decided mm -hmm. to... Yeah, Mr. Gole, Mr. Gole, 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 kindly hold on. All those 28 senators, people who sent them to Abuja, that is the only way we can put those who represent us to account. All right, kindly hold on, Mr. Gole. Uh, I'm going to bring in Mark uh, Adebayo again. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned, Mr. Debaya, is that uh, Nigeria is behaving like a rogue state. Um, so I, I want you to, you yes. know, share with us, you know, from, from the international community's perspective and also from the rest of Africa, Nigeria has, you know, supposedly been Africa's big brother. We've said this a few times, a giant of Africa, biggest economy in Africa, some of all of that. But do you think that these countries can see beyond the lies and the, you know, the statements of the Nigerian government and, you know, see, you know, the places where Nigeria is not being entirely honest? Can the international community read between the lines um, concerning the issues Nigeria is currently dealing with vis-a-vis um, -vis the statements from the Nigerian government? Well, thank you so much. Before I, I address that, I want to disagree with you, Mr. Agulie. Uh, in the statement that he said Nigerians are so docile. No, Nigerians are not docile. Nigerians are over-traumatized. After decades of misrule, after decades of terrible bad governance, we, the Nigerians are over-traumatized. There are a lot of courageous Nigerians. Nigerians are not docile. Um, I, I think it is the elite. It is the elite that is uh, disappointing the mass of Nigerians. It is the elite that has refused to organize Nigerians towards you know, actuating their, 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 their electoral uh, rights. So we should not blame Nigerians. We should blame the bad leaders. We should blame the terrible, the terrible human beings who are ruling us. So it is not about Nigeria. Nigerians are not those side. Even when the governor, the sitting governor of a state, tries, that is a cookie state, tried to effect the recall of a, of a, of a senator, it, 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 couldn't, it couldn't achieve it. Because we have a constitution that is a, that is a problem to all of us. Now, having said that, on the issue of the federal government and the international community, um, let, you know, it was in those days that Nigeria was a giant of Africa. That, that we have long lost that status. Uh, population does not make you a giant. Size does not make you a giant. You know that you can make noise does not make you a giant. So, in the area of economy, you know, even Rwanda is better than us. 
You know, Egypt is better than us. Morocco is far better than us. Ghana is better, far better than us. Many other countries. Right, Nigeria is not among is not among the first ten best, best economies in Africa. So we are we a giant. Militarily, we have become an ant. It was it was Chad that was helping us to fight against Boko Haram. We couldn't, you know. We couldn't, so we are we forget about the giant of Africa. So it was in those days that Nigeria uh, was respected as a giant of Africa. Not now that we have all manner of all, all, all manner of incompetent of incompetent rulers, you know, pretending to be leaders in the country. Well, no, 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 the kind of so we are no longer giant of Africa. We have a lot to learn, even from Rwanda. We have a lot to learn, even from Ghana and even from this small, tiny country called Benin Republic. So, forget, don't stop okay. calling Nigeria giant of Africa. Okay. Now, um, I, I'm sure that uh, the international community will be able to read in between the lines. Whether they will intervene in a decisive manner that we will have loved is a, is a, is a, is a different uh, uh, ball game entirely. So, the I. I do not, I do not believe, I, and I do not accept that both Sunday Adi Yemo and Nambikan should be treated like criminals because they are fighting for their rights, they are fighting, fighting for their people. You know, it was Franz Fanon that said that a society that drives its citizens, its members, to a desperate solution is not a society that is that is viable it's, not, it's an unviable society and that is where nigeria is where you drive your your members where you drive your citizens to desperate situations do you know how many decades now we have been calling for we have been calling we have been calling for the structuring of this country we have been calling for the structuring of this country for how many decades now they refuse to listen now well, people who thought that even the Russian would not go far enough came up with the idea of self-determination. That look, let us let everybody go their separate ways. That Nigeria has expired. Now, some of us, the few of us that believe that Nigeria should remain one, that we should struggle to try and save this dying horse. Now we have been pushed aside by more aggressive, more determined uh, elements, younger elements who believe that look, Nigeria, there's nothing you can do to save Nigeria. Let us move. And then this federal government is behaving in a way that discourages discussing about the unity of Nigeria. You know, you, you have a federal government that behaves as if the South does not exist. You, you are behaving as if you are a government of, of Fulani alone. So how do you want the rest of the country to feel? You know, I know some of us campaign for Buhari now in 2014. Some of us are campaigning for one. We thought, but within the first one year, he has lost. The, he has lost all of us because we thought he was coming as a redeemer. We thought he was coming as a liberator. We thought he was coming to 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 do justice. We didn't know he was coming with a preconceived ethno-religious agenda, which is what is ruining and destroying this country today. So, okay. I mean, if anybody can talk to the president, he, he swore to be the president of Nigeria. Uh, okay, tell me under what circumstances. What did you think informed the meeting between the federal government, including chief, uh, the former chief of uh, army staff, who is now our ambassador in uh, Buratai, who is now ambassador in the Republic? Where did them, where, what, what, what informed their meeting with, with GM Tiala and they were negotiating with them to give them 100 billion naira for them to stop the violence, for them to stop the kidnapping? They are begging them with 100 billion naira. And that's why I said the presidency supports them. And I have said on air severally that the ATL is a privileged terrorist organization in Nigeria because the government romances with them. Our governors take photographs with bandits. So clerics go into the bush to, 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 to take photographs with DSS operatives, police operatives, military operatives, standing and posing for pictures with, with the bandits, with terrorists. But why in the South, people who are asking for elementary fundamental human rights are being hounded down locally and internationally to be brought back to Nigeria like animals to be treated like animals. Nigeria was unable for 10 years. Nigeria was unable to, to, to get rid of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the leader of, uh, of Boko Haram, you know, until Israel helped us to kill him, to, to eliminate him. But now, you go after some targets. People are asking for freedom. You see, in the South, because of our education, like Mr. Gouli has been said, we should follow the rule of law, we should follow the constitution that are not being followed even by, by the people, government in power, we should follow all these things. Now, 
because of our education, because of our civilization, we try to follow these new processes. But what happens? We become victims of our knowledge and education. The people who are carrying arms are being respected, are being reimbursed by the government. You remember what happened in Safara State? The party leader that was brought into, into the town and given millions of naira, bought a camp, given a house at the government reservation area in Safara State. What happened? He went back to the bush. He went back into the bush. Mr. So, Mr. Mark Adebayo, um, please, can yes. we hold on? Let's let's bring in Mr. Nick Agule um, for his thoughts, you know, where you stopped. Mr. Agule, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so when you see what's happening on social media, what Nigerians are saying, and uh, it just seems, you know, like I mentioned earlier, that Sunday Woho has garnered a lot of support. I saw one report, I don't know how verifiable that is, that Sunday Woho has about 318 million supporters. But what impact do you think this might make and have in Nigeria if it turns out that Nigerians, you know, begin to um, organize protests here, especially in the Southwest, you know, in defense of Sunday Woho? Uh, Sunday Woho is gathering support. Because the Nigerian government we have today is alienating our people. And it's precisely because the people don't feel they have a government that is protective of them, a government that is delivering good governance to them, a government that sees every Nigerian as equal and having an equal stake in the Federation of Nigeria that is making people to turn to the lives of Sunday Bo and Nandi Kanu this is the testament on the performance of government. I, I believe that the Nigerian government should be worried about this. If Sunday Boho and the Nadi Kanus are generating or gathering or gathering this kind of support, it's a testament that the Nigerian government is not providing a safe sanctuary for everybody. Mm. Now, what, for to me, the support that the likes of Nadi Kanu and Sunday Boho have, should be put to use, should be put to use in a democratic setting. How so? And not in an arms, yes. How, how, how can that be put to use? Okay, fine. So what I'm saying is that, instead of going on an armed, an armed insurrection, because that is not going to do anybody any good. At the end of the day, federal agents are going to come and carry out all sorts of genocide, genocidal acts against the people. So an armed insurrection for me is, is actually against the people. So the, the, the Sunday Bohos and the Nadikanus should use the support that they have in a democratic setting, for, first and foremost, Getting people to the ballot. Get people to the ballot box so that we can elect those who can work for us. Those who say that the ballot box is not an effective means of getting the government we want are not correct because the, the politicians are afraid of our votes. If they were not afraid of our votes, they will not be trying to tamper with the electoral bill to stop things like electronic transmission. They will not be trying to inject partisan people like Mrs. Sondorche into INEC. They are doing all these things because they are afraid of our votes. Our votes are our weapons. And if you are faced with an enemy, you don't throw your weapons away. That is when you use your weapons and confront the enemy with. So Nigerians must go out and vote. The, the INET has now opened the portal for registration. Last election, we had 30 million Nigerians come out to vote for the presidency. Can we get 50, 60, 80, 100 million Nigerians come out and vote for candidates at all levels that we do our bidding, that will provide us accountable and responsive governance? If we don't do this, then we can analyze on this live TV, right on Facebook, on social media for another four years, and things will not change. Hmm. All right. Um, Sunday, Boho should get the Yoruba states to start recording all the Yoruba senators. Record them from Abuja. He has the support. Let him use it. Bring back all the senators. And then elect senators who will go to Abuja and put a referendum 
Constitution. Okay. All right, uh, Marka Debayo. Uh, one thing, a, a lot of um, uh, one thing that always comes up, you know, with regards uh, these conversations is uh, interest. You know, and there's always the argument that countries would never step in or never, you know, get involved with, you know, some of all these things because they have interest to protect. Um, if you remember, you know, when there have been numerous agitations and people keep asking for the UK's or the United States or Donald Trump's or Joe Biden's involvement, there is always a reminder that these countries have interest. And if their interests are not in any way um, disturbed, then they have no business getting involved with, you know, the internal issues of Nigeria and, of course, as a sovereign state also. So I want to know if, what you think about Nigeria's value as it stands to countries, the neighboring West African countries, um, and also maybe the international community. Do you think Nigeria still has a lot of value that it offers to these countries that you know makes them always want to be on Nigeria's good side? Well, you, you see, you are correct on that. Um, the Western world, the advanced countries will never intervene in any situation, no matter how bad it may be, if there are no interests, especially their economic interest, you know, as far as their, their security interest. So they, 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 they will not, they will not, uh, they really they don't care. That is why you could see that even internationally, some countries, some powerful countries are blocking arms sale to Nigeria. It's as bad as that. It tells you how unuseful to them Nigeria has become for them to be blocking arms sale to Nigeria. So that is why I keep telling some of our people in the human rights community that people should not depend on the international community to start a fight because they are not going to come to your aid. Right in their presence, for in less than four months, one million people were murdered in, uh, in Rwanda. People were waiting for the international community to come to their aid. Nothing ever came. Today, they've uh, imposed some uh, poor sanctions on Burma. But uh, the military there is still, is, still, is still in power, still killing people, still massacring people. It, a, a people that want freedom should not depend on the international community to fight for their freedom. What we can do is to, uh, is to make use, is to take advantage of the international instruments of liberation that are available. You go to the International Criminal Court to present your case, you understand? You go to the United Nations to present your case for self-determination. So where there are international instruments, legal instruments that can help you do that. That is what you can do on an international basis. But do not believe that if you throw your country into crisis, you know, that anybody is going to come to your aid. Nigeria is not that useful to the international community anymore. So if not, they will not be blocking uh, arms sale to fight insurgents in Nigeria. And that is because they know that when they give you these weapons, even the little that we have, we are not turning it against the terrorists. We are turning it against freedom fighters and SARS, peaceful, unarmed protesters. So they will give, the international community will not give you arms to kill people who are not a problem to your country. How do you, how do you, how, how, how does anybody justify the fact that people are protesting peacefully without arms and you go there and begin to shoot them? Like bullet. Look at what happened to recently. We had that 25 year old little girl was shot dead by the police. The CP of Lagos came out lying, telling lies to the whole world that they did not use life ammunition in that protest. And then it came out. The, the, the autopsy report came out to say the young lady was killed by bullets. And so, well, how do you how do you expect the international community to allow them to sell arms to you to kill innocent people? That is one of the things that we need to do. Having said that, uh, a friend, uh, a friend who you supposed to know, a friend on uh, on international affairs with bias with the security studies, once told me that uh, we should that one of the fears of the international community is that they do not want to have another Islamic state in Africa in addition to their problems. That if they allow, if they support the South to go, if they support the South to go, and if you allow the North to be, to, to be there, the North will automatically, you know, most likely going to be another Islamic state, which the, the international community does not want. So by that, it is in their interest to keep us together, no matter the injustices, no matter the inequities, no matter the imbalances. They believe it is out should continue to suffer. And if you know the way we came out, we emerged as Nigeria. The, the ignoble roles played by the UK in making the North stronger, bigger than, than the South, 
you will know that the, the UK is not our friend in the South. Recently in Taraba State, the 19 other states held a meeting. The, the, the UK ambassador was there, present there. Right? The question was that when the 17 southern state governors were meeting, you know, she never came. So people were wondering what was her interest wearing the same clothes with uh, the other state governors and he went there for the... For, when Obama was, uh, was, was the president, the then, uh, the then Secretary of State went to, came to Nigeria did not go. Did not go to Abuja. Jonathan was president there. Did not go to Abuja. Went straight to Sokoto to meet with Sultan of Sokoto and went to meet a few, a few, a few governors in the north. Thereafter, about uh, ten governors of the north went to, to visit to visit him in, a, 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 in Washington. So that is a that's an international conspiracy. I believe that's an international conspiracy, international conspiracy even to make Nigeria remain one, despite the injustices, despite the imbalances. And that is why we must not play to their hands. It is in that respect that I, I support what Mr. Abuli has said, that we should try and follow the process, in, in, for me, in terms of international diplomacy of self-determination. But in Nigeria, for us to depend on this national assembly, to, to do, to, to input a... Uh, 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 a referendum clause to the Nigerian constitution, we will wait forever. Okay. We will wait forever. Thank you, Mr. Magadibayo. Are there not southern senators yeah. who went and voted against electronic transmission of results? They went there and voted against it. And against right. electronic transmission of results. So justice is not likely to come through elections in this mm. country. And that is why some people uh, who are, if you like, of, uh, well, maybe if you like, violent in, in nature, or who, who wish that, who say that the, 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 that the vehicle of, of justice is, is, is rolling too slowly, are likely to take up, uh, to take processes that are not going to be uh, totally legal. And uh, the people will follow them. That is why you have the support for Sunday Boho and some of us who did not support them before. But because of the way they have been treated, because of the way we in the South have been treated, uh, then we, we have no sure that to support them now. I okay, do not Mr. know whether Mark we are Israel. listening to the uh, MR. Uh, MA of here in, uh, in Niger State, in his uh, Ramadan, in his uh, 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 in the other uh, message. Yesterday, just yesterday, or before yesterday, the MA was so angry that he declared war on the Fulani uh, in, Niger, in Niger State. I don't know whether you have seen that video. Mm -hmm. It's a very serious one. If it is in the South, any monarch says that, by now, JSS will have invaded his palace and taken him away. Thank you, Mr. Adibayo. Let's bring in Mr. Agule for his final thoughts. Mr. Agule, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So we know that it's, you know, instances like this that is enough to cause a diplomatic row between countries. How do you think this might affect the diplomatic relations between Nigeria and Benin Republic? Do you see the government, you know, sorry. putting sanctions? No, sorry, come back again with that question. I said, how do you think this instance might cause a diplomatic row or might affect the diplomatic relations between Nigeria and Benin. Do you see Nigeria pulling its weights to impose any sanctions of, of any sort on Benin Republic? I, I completely agree with uh, what my co-panelist, Makadebayo, said. It's unfortunate that a small, a very tiny country, West Africa, can Benin Republic, is teaching the so-called giant of Africa in a democracy. Nigeria has no choice than to follow due process and the rule of law which the Republic wants to follow. I cannot see how Nigeria can start a diplomatic row with the Republic when the Republic is insisting on the rule of law. If Nigeria attempts anything like that, we will only soil the more our image in the international community. So for me, we have no choice. If the Republic says, look, we are putting this thing through our legal process, Nigeria just needs to follow that process. It is the only way that we get confidence. In okay, Mr. Agule, it's unfortunate we're, yeah, struggling, they, to, they, we're, we're struggling to hear you. I apologize for that. Yes, Mr. Agule, um, 
Can you hold on? Let's get in Mr. Debaye for his final thoughts. Um, still about this situation, do you foresee any yes. diplomatic... Yes. Mr. Debayo, do you foresee any yeah. diplomatic impact, you know, between Nigeria and Benin Republic? You know, like we see in other countries, maybe Nigeria recalling her uh, Benin ambassador or any other diplomatic move by Nigeria that this, or you know, in the whole borders case, again. yes, or even closing the borders, yes. Do you see Nigeria taking any action on, you know, on Benin Republic based on this incident? <clears throat> He just uh, took uh, he just took the word straight out of my mouth now. Uh, the, 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 that is, the, you know, we have a very vengeful, very extremely vengeful uh, presidency in place now. The number one uh, stick they are going to use was uh, to close the borders. If uh, the Republic refuses to play ball as they want it, they definitely are going to come up with some funny sanctions against the Republic. About seventy percent of the cross-border trade that Benin uh, does with any country comes to Nigeria. So, you know, during the Abacha regime, actually Abacha did not say, did not threaten them that we were going to close the border. Abacha threatened them that he was going to annex, he was going to take the Republic of, of Benin to Nigeria because they thought that uh, Radio Kudira was being run from Benin Republic, and they thought that Professor Wojilo Shoyinka was also in Benin Republic. So. So that was why, you know, people like Dr. Akimba and Co., who uh, are many of them of his life, who are in the Benin Republic, they had to they had to take off from the Republic of Republic because Benin could not start the military strength at, as at that time. Not now, as at that time, where, because the Apache threatened to annex Benin Republic to Nigeria. It was, it was that place. So, and now, what, what the definitive government of Nigeria would do in the case of Iboho, if the Benin Republic refuses, insists on following international best practices of following due process, will be number one to close the border, uh, and uh, re probably recall, they may not recall, and they may recall the, uh, the ambassador and tell them to recall their own too. So they are probably going to win the huge armor, and then this, and then discontinue our international collaboration in terms of, uh, you know, uh, patrolling the international waters that are border in order to stop uh, to stem the ties of uh, uh, pirates operating on that. So they could do that. Mr. But Nibayo, we we actually are out of time. Can you, in ten seconds, in just the smallest amount of words, tell us about the influence of Tukobro Tai, the chief of uh, army staff, a uh, former chief of army staff, who is now a carry ambassador, non carry ambassador? Uh, do you, does he have any influence in this in this situation? Is definitely it does. Definitely it does, and it's going to be huge. It's going to be huge. All right, Mark Adibayo, thank you very much. Uh, we need to go. We appreciate thank your you. time this yes. morning. Thank you very much for a very interesting thank conversation. So thank you, and thank you Nika very Gule. much, Mr. Nika Gule, for your time. We appreciate you joining us from Abuja. Thank, thank you so much. Sorry for the network; it has been very oh, bad. Not, not your fault. Not your thank fault. you. All yeah. right, have a great day, gentlemen. It's been an interesting time here on the breakfast. If you missed out on any part of the conversation, do remember to follow us on all our social media pages and on YouTube. We're at Plus TV Africa. And if you're not following us yet, please do on our new channel. It's at Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. I am Aneta Phoenix. And I am Osao Gye Ogbon. See you tomorrow.